A reading from the second book of Maccabees. It happened that seven brothers with their mother were arrested and tortured with whips and scourges by the king to force them to eat pork in violation of God's law. One of the brothers speaking for the other said, what do you expect to achieve by questioning us? We are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. At the point of death, he said, you accursed fiend, you are depriving us of this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his laws that we are dying. After him, the third suffered their cruel sport. He put out his tongue at once when told to do so, and bravely held out his hands as he spoke these noble words. It was from heaven that I received these. For the sake of his laws, I disdain them. From him I hope to receive them again. Even the king and his attendants marveled at the young man's courage, because he regarded his sufferings as nothing. After he had died, they tortured and maltreated the fourth brother in the same way. When he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of men, with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. <laughs>
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself in God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement in good hope through his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us so that the word of the Lord may speed forward and be glorified as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We are confident of you in the Lord that what we instruct you you are doing and will continue to do. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the endurance of Christ. Dominus Fabescum, et cum spiritu tuo, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Matim et Domine. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies leaving a child, a wife, but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman, but died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and likewise all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush, when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Verbum Domini. The Sadducees seem to be trying to trap Jesus or to trick him into this logical point of uh, making the position of the resurrection a a ridiculous one. The Sadducees were told they did not believe in the resurrection. They just believed in the 
Torah, the first uh, five books of the Bible. <clears throat> we have the first reading today from Maccabees, talks about a, a resurrection. So we can see in the Old Testament uh, hints you know, of the doctrine of a resurrection. But the Sadducees reject it and they present this problem to Jesus uh, about multiple marriages and you know, whose wife in heaven uh, will this woman be. And Jesus takes this opportunity to teach us something about heaven, right? That there's no giving and taking in marriage. And as tradition has pondered this and meditated upon it and explained it, that we see marriage as a, a beautiful sign of the love that Jesus has for us, the love that he has for the church, and that it's passing away. <clears throat> and of course, in Christ, it's raised the dignity of sacrament, and all the sacraments, right, are, are pointing to this reality of Christ, his love for us, his gift for us on the cross and the resurrection, the gift of his Holy Spirit to us. So all these sacraments are passing away to the full experience of that reality in our heavenly life. And marital love as an especially eloquent witness to God's love for us, right? Pope Benedict in his encyclical on love, he said it's a glimpse of an apparently irresistible promise of happiness, right? A glimpse of this irresistible promise of happiness that's just written in our nature. We long to belong to another, to experience love, to give love in return. And uh, we know that that is our ultimate happiness, right? To have this communion with another. <clears throat> it's oftentimes described you know, as a burning love, right? To possess the other, to give ourselves to another and to receive from that other one. There's a sense of completion that marriage has in it, uh, that uh, in the sexual complementarity, there's a completeness in the other. We think of Adam in the book of Genesis, when Eve is brought to him, he, he gives this uh, beautiful love song, you know, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, that he is, uh, he marvels at the creation of Eve. Right? And we even see in the text that you know, the, the word, the verb that describes you know, this fashioning of Adam versus this creation of Eve, there's a nobler word you know, used for Eve. And it's this, it highlights just the gift of one is to the other. Right? And, and Adam just bursts into joy right, when he sees Eve. So this is a beautiful witness to God's love for us. And I thought I would take this opportunity just to talk a little bit about, more about marriage because, you know, it's become clouded today in our understanding of it and our culture. Um, we still, in movies and even love songs and things, we capture something of the power of it and the burning nature of it and things, and that can be beautiful. Uh, but certainly a fullness isn't presented in our movies and our, our songs and things. And, the church describes it in, in Vatican II as a, first off, that it's an eminently human love, that conjugal love, marital love, is not mere emotion, right? It just doesn't stop at that instinct and those powerful feelings that we have. Those are building blocks of love, right? We see that love, marital love goes further, but it's a human love in that it's grounded in an act of free will arising from choice. And that's what makes marriage, right? That consent one gives to the other. And this is expressed. These vows we make in marriage are an expression of this love we have with our very bodies, right? That, that uh, we make in, in the sexual act, right? We give ourselves to the other. So it's human in that it's freely given. It's a choice. It's a consent uh, we give to the other to, to love that person forever. And of course, marital love is a, is a total love involving the body and the spirit. It expresses our whole being. And Vatican II said that such love, merging the human with the divine, leads the spouses to a free and mutual gift of themselves, a gift proving itself by gentle affection and by deeds. Such love pervades the whole of, the, of their lives, the, the couple's lives. I love that expression, because most of it's gentle in the daily, ordinary life. Uh, expressed in deeds, you know, that, that it grows and fosters there. Paul VI described it in Humanae Vitae. He said this uh, conjugal love in which 
Uh, husband, it's a very special form of personal friendship in which husband and wife generously share everything, allowing no unreasonable exceptions and not thinking solely of their own convenience. Right? We, we give ourselves to the other. So one in conjugal love wants to give oneself for the total good of the beloved, has concern and care for the other, is no longer self-seeking. Involves, because we're body and soul, it involves the entire person, including one's fertility. You know, Paul VI makes that very eloquent point in Humanae Vitae that we can't hold back the fertility aspect, right, like in contraception. But we give ourselves totally. And therefore, because it's life-giving as well, it is a special good for society, right? It raises up children and, and, and furthers, makes uh, society possible. And, and just as an aside point, I was listening recently to a story about uh, the population crisis that the world is in globally, right, with the declining population right, rates. And certainly, you know, at the heart of that is a misunderstanding, I think, of what marriage is. is that has, radically has this openness to life. So, it's, as John Paul II described it, it's a, a self-gift, a gift we make of ourselves to another that's written in our very bodies, right? You can see that um, in the sex, sexual complementarity. Also, marital love is faithful and exclusive. It is an exclusive love which demands absolute fidelity. You know, by its very nature, it says, if I'm gonna give myself to you completely, I can't just say that's for a certain period of time, right? That contradicts that, you know, that, that part of it being total. And so, you know, any woman would know that. If the guy gets down on his knees and says, I commit myself to you for six years, right? Or something ridiculous, uh, I don't think she would accept the offer. offer. We know that it's a, it's a permanent bond. Even though we, we fail at it uh, so often, uh, we know, though, the nature of it demands this totality, this faithfulness, and this exclusivity. So it's a consent, it's a choice that has a, a forever link to it, right, by its very nature. It looks, as Benedict described it, it looks to the eternal. And we see all this is taken up in Jesus' love for us, has all these elements as well. Finally, it's uh, fruitful. Again, rooted in that totality of a gift of self, which includes one's fertility, it's a fruitful love. And the church describes it first as a, a spiritual fruitfulness. It's ordained as an ordination to new life. And we see that a bond is formed between the two entering marriage that, that has this new life to it, that something new is given there. And of course, it has the possibility of bringing a new biological life into the world. And this is a powerful image of the Trinity, which is a communion of life and love. There in the Godhead, we see the fullness of life and love. We experience that uh, through faith and through loving God. And even in cases of infertility due to old age or disease, it still continues in a way to give new life. You know, as I mentioned, the as it serves the common good of society, certainly, as I said, bringing forth children, but if that's not possible, it also serves that common good by being an, o an oasis of peace and love. You know, where life, where people are welcomed into that, that communion. And haven't we all experienced that? You know, being, uh, having friends that are married couples or families, right, and, and they welcome you into their family, that's just, uh, a new life that's given to us, right, when we share in that. So also the church teaches that that procreative capacity carries the couple beyond themselves into the mystery of creation. And this is one of the most amazing things that, you know, in cases where a couple can have children, you know, it's a share in that creative ability of God. We call it procreative because the couple is not creating new life, right? God infuses the soul. He creates the soul in the immediate act of creation, you know, and imparts that to the person. But certainly, the couple's involved, and we call it procreative. And that is one of the greatest mysteries, that, you know, as God is creative in his love towards us, he makes us, fashions us from nothingness, 
you know, the couple is involved in that. And John Paul II has also uh, written about how we, the couple discovers the deepest meaning of their bodies in this gift of new life, this fertility, uh, this capacity to be fertile and to bring forth new life. So we, you know, discover this power that is entrusted to the male, to the man and the woman. So in saying all this, you know, Jesus is saying that this greatest earthly good of marriage is passing in a sense, right? It doesn't exist in heaven, that it's a natural sign of God's love for man, right? Scripture begins with a marriage and Genesis ends with the wedding feast of the Lamb, that it's this deepest revelation of God's uh, personal love for us. You know, it's, as I mentioned, it's this great good for the spouses, it's life-giving, and God's love is creative, right? It gives life. He makes us uh, from nothingness, invites us to this intimate communion with him that he wants to, to have with us, that we see in the couple. He wants to have that with us on a personal level. So the first aspect, you know, the way that it mirrors God's love is that God has a, a personal love for man. If you've ever, and maybe some of you experienced this, if you've ever spoken to a parent that has a, a child in prison, and uh, I've had that opportunity to speak with uh, parents in that situation, I'm always struck by the witness of their love for their children in that situation, right? The, their son or daughter is, just seems to be lost, you know, he's in the prison system, maybe he's there, you know, obviously it could be for his own, uh, he's guilty and he couldn't find a better way to live, so to speak. And, but the love the parent has for that child never ceases. And I thought, man, what an what a analogy for God's love for us, right? We're imprisoned in sin. We're lost. We can't find a better way out. And God's heart is moved with compassion for us as a father is moved for compassion for his son who's in prison, right? I've seen that uh, several times, and it's, it's quite moving, and it speaks of God. Isn't that more powerful to think, okay, you know, I can think abstractly, have faith, salvation in Jesus Christ, destined for heaven. Isn't it different when we say God is moved with compassion for us? He wants us to enjoy this heavenly life with us, not just kind of coldly offering it to us, but his heart is moved that we share this life with him, that he wants us to be with him forever. So much so that, you know, the totality that we see in marriage, we see in Jesus, right, that the Father sends his Son to die for us, that God has given us everything in Christ, that we may belong to him. He makes us temples of the Holy Spirit, where he pours forth the very spirit of the Trinity into our hearts. Right, we see this total committed love on Calvary, right? Jesus makes a gift of himself, and this gift is fully perfected in the second coming at the resurrection of the body where we receive a, a glorified body. So it's, it's a completion there where we're raised uh, from the dead, and this inaugurates the eternal wedding feast of the Lamb, right? That's begun on Calvary, completed in his second coming. And of course, as marriage, it's a free love. God is under no compulsion to create us or to love us. Uh, he does it freely. He creates us out of love. He redeems us out of love. He chooses to love us, right, as a married couple gives consent to one another. And of course, it's faithful and exclusive. He never cease, ceases to love us. He forms, we see in the Old Testament covenants uh, with Israel, leading to the new covenant in Jesus Christ, uh, the new and eternal covenant. There will be no more future covenants that he offers us a, a forgiveness of sins. He offers us new life. He never quits loving us. He's always faithful. And if we are faithful, you know, in living that covenant and living his law, we come to experience ourselves as being loved by God, right? Our fidelity to him awakens us to that love. He's always loving us, but when we live his commandments to what he taught us, we are awakened, we experience that love in a new way. 
And I've been privileged as a priest to see that in so many people's lives, you know, especially in the confessional. And of course, his love for us is fruitful. It's life-giving. A new life is born in us, and we are born into that new life in Jesus Christ, and we are transformed. And we're called to live that transformed life, to, lit to witness to the gospel. Again, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict speaks about the need, you know, at the opening for the year for faith, he speaks about the need of this. He, say, he said we live in a, a greater desert now than at the time of Vatican II. And he was challenging us at this year of faith to reread the documents of Vatican II, to go back to the letter of them. What did they actually say? And that as part of this new evangelization, we're called, and the world is especially hungry for this witness of a transformed life, that I have faith in Jesus Christ. My life has changed. I'm, I've been given new life. And I'm living according to this life of the Spirit. Right? That speaks to people. Right? And he says that's at the heart of the new evangelization. So simply put, in all this, that man is created out of love and for love. We have this destiny in God. We have this destiny uh, to be loved and to experience this love in Jesus Christ. So marriage is a passing sign fulfilled in heaven. And we can't even fully appreciate it, right? We can't fully understand it. As Paul says, you know, quoting Isaiah, you know, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. Beyond our wildest imaginations, right? We can look, look forward to that. And thanks be to God. Right? We need something better than what's here on earth. <laughs> we need a fullness that Jesus gives us, and that will sustain us.